Uh, now I welcome you to the session um, circling about radiogenomic uh, profiling in gynecologic cancer. How can we decipher the link between imaging and genetics? A quite uh, ambitious title. Uh, together with Alan Hordeland, the first speaker, we will uh, chair this session and I will introduce Alan. He works as a senior researcher at MMIV at Haukeland University Hospital and also holds a position as adjunct professor, associate professor at Department of Mathematics, UIB. Arlen is a mathematician by training, but I will say exhibits this unique quality to masterly collaborate with scientists from other disciplines, including medical scientists from the medical domain, illustrated by Arlen authoring more than 40 publications in PubMed. So, and he has been instrumental for pulling the machine learning initiatives at the MMIV. The last three years, very much focusing on gynecologic cancer imaging data. Today, Alan will tell us more about platforms for radiomic tumor profiling in cancer imaging. Please, Alan, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Ingrid, for the nice introduction. Um, <clears throat> I will now present to you not a very strict, like, uh, complete overview of radiomics uh, in the literature. I will, this is more like a practical uh, example of how things can be done. And I also show you some of the local results we have from radiomic profiling here at MMIV. Uh, I'll first define the word radiomics, which uh, there's no strict definition of radiomics, but I think this definition is, fits quite well what we mean about it. Radiomics is the extraction of quantitative features from medical images using data characterization algorithms. So I'll come back to more the de to the details about it. So this shows the the workflow in its simplest uh, form. You're starting out with image or images and corresponding segmentations, typically of tumors. You typically then extract one parameter for each feature or within that ROI or maybe a sub ROI. This collects to a large feature vector, which you then, of course, can plot in feature space, but it's typically very high dimensional. So it's not uh, so useful to, to do this plotting. And then um, you would like at the end to do some kind of clustering. Could be unsupervised, where you want to split your patients into different groups. Or you want, might want to tailor it to some clinical outcome in regression models, train it. You need to verify a model on unseen data to know if it has some kind of generalization power. And at the end, you hope that you have some clinical relevance that you can use, that can potentially be used in clinical practice. Okay, so we have a large number of features, and there's no strict definition of what is an a texture feature or image feature that can be used in radiomics. You can define your own features, of course. But there has been a very uh, much increase in focus on generalization, standardization of these features because of, of uh, reproducibility of science. So most people use the first order statistics like mean, standard deviation, entropy, kurtosis, and etc. And uh, most people also use those parameters that are connected to volume, surface area, how well it fits to uh, a ball, compactness, diameter, etc. Many people use Gabo filters, and I make these dots because there are there's practical endless number of features they can use. Uh, those four lines here with a GLCM, GLRLM, GLSATSM and GTDM and GLDM 
they are, I would just call them now, matrix-based features. They're also commonly used, and they have in common that they, they investigate the relation between voxels in space. How do voxels repeat? How do neighboring voxels repeat over in, in, in space in x, y, and z direction? And then, of course, some people, they do filtering or transform the images using the Laplacian wavelet, etc., nonlinear transformation functions. Before applying all these, these uh, uh, methods, and, and the result is that you have no limit on the number of features, practically. But it does, it's not necessarily better to have more features. So for those of you that are not so familiar with these image texture features, I just want to make a very practical example of GLCM, which is the most common one of these matrix-based features. So if you're starting out with a matrix here, this could be an image, MR image, a very small image. And these numbers, yeah, that's the numbers that come from the MR machine. And this P matrix, that's the GLCM matrix, which counts the number of occurrences of neighboring values. So let's say this one here refers that you have a one followed by a one. So you get the imposition one, you get one. And these two, you have, you have a one followed by a two happens twice. And the position one, two, sorry, happens three times. You, you put a, a number three. So this P matrix here is a frequency matrix of neighborship relations. And from this kind of matrix, you typically compute uh, parameters like contrast, reflecting the intensity contrast between pixels and the neighbors, the correlation of a pixel to its neighbor, the sum of squared elements, and homogeneity, closeness to di diagonal. There are also many more of these variables. But these names are meant to say something about the interpretation of this, this parameter. So this is one value that comes up out from these formulas here. And those values that uh, show up, they go into the, this feature vector. And one can hardly talk about radiomics without mentioning IBSI, Image Biomarker Standardization Initiative. This is a very good initiative. And we can also see that we have our own Ara Lossen go here somewhere, here. Because they attempted to standardize these features so you better can compare studies across centers. So if you know that they have followed this IPSI stand standard, at least things are more comparable than this. everybody made their own image features. And I would also like to mention this pyradiomics software, which is very commonly used, very popular. This is a Python-based tool for extracting image texture features. It's very easy to use. It's py if you have a Python script you can use, or can you can run it from the, from the shell. So if you want to compare to other people's research, it's a very good starting point to use pyradiomics. OK, pre-processing steps. I will only talk about one type of pre-processing, because I think that was the most interesting right now. Uh, there are, of course, more pre-processing steps that you might need to consider. Could be uh, you need to make sure that your images are of high quality, of course. They should be um, properly co-registered as, as, uh, as far as possible. Uh, but I want to talk now about the normalization problem. I call it the curse of normalization, because this gave me some headache some while ago. So here I made a very... Uh, simple example, I present I have a cohort of 30 patients, and each patient has uh, uh, image text to values of these blue dots. And when I do a blind clustering, then I get the red dots, which are either one or two, which are the clus cluster belongings. So very simply said, the, the high blue values, they belong to the cluster two, and the low ones belong to cluster one. So maybe we now captured some kind of important biological feature that you wanted to capture, because it was a perfect setup, perfect study. It was completely standardized in terms of hardware operators, MR protocol, and patients, and so on. But this is not how real life situation is. So it could be that half of the patients that were acquired on a 1.5 Tesla, and one half of them were acquired on a 3 Tesla equipment. 
And from the physics, we know that there's an increase in signal when you go to free Tesla, at least on a TD, T1 weighted. I don't remember it was square root of 2 or doubling, double or something like that. But definitely we get higher signal in one quart than the other, which is not biological. This is pure hardware. And if we do clustering, it's purely based on the hardware. And this is not very interesting to publish. So how to deal with this? So definitely, by failing to properly normalize your data, you may cluster the patients based on inappropriate conditions like hardware and site, operators, etc., and thus hiding the important biological phenotypes of interest. And to reveal some of these relations, what I did was I did a Fisher exact test on suspicious variables like hardware and test for clusters. If there is an overrepresentation of one cluster or the other in or some type of hardware. So if this becomes significant, it's a bad sign. And you need to dig into your data to see what's going on. So there are several approaches for normalization. You can, of course, normalize your image before you compute the texture variables. You can do it. You can normalize the image texture variables, or you can do both. I did both in my uh, in other rich, the project we were. Uh, working at. And the most common normalization approaches is typically a min-max normalization, which is very sensitive to outliers, of course. Set normalization, which is the most commonly used, then you pull everything down to zero mean and standard deviation one. Histogram normalization can indiscriminate indiscrimin and blow up some, kind, some intervals. And you have also, of course, nonlinear activation functions, but then you should know some, something about your data. And you might not know these unknown relations. So now focus on the set normalization and the min-max normalization, which are most commonly used. So if I do a set normalization of this fake study that I just generated, nothing, it doesn't help at all. You still have these two clusters that are completely based on, on hardware, 1.5 or versus 3 Tesla. And of course, these uh, blue dots now, they have a zero mean, and they have a standard deviation of one. So everything is fulfilled according to the standardization. I could also do a min-max standardization. So the minimum value now is zero, and the maximum value is one. But nothing has improved, of course. The method worked, but it doesn't, didn't solve our problem. So we still cluster these this uh, patient is based on hardware. So what I realized I had to do was to, to, to normalize the data first on, on based on the hardware. So I took out only the patients that belonged to the 1.5 Tesla, did a set normalization, and then repeated this procedure for the free Tesla group. So you separate those groups separate, you normalize the groups separately, which solved the problem. Now we capture the biological differences again. The drawback is, of course, that you have to split the data in smaller groups, and then the, the power of this normalization goes down, and the reliability of it depends on how large n you have. And you might need to do this repeatedly. I did it both on site and on hardware, but there can be other factors that influence your data significantly that you might need to do this four on, with four or five different factors, and then it, it grows exponentially. OK, so I want to show you two use cases. You will, you will hear more about these cases from Erling Høvik and, and Mari afterwards. The first one is about uh, unsupervised clustering of endometrial cancer patients based on image features. So this is how the pictures look. We have a T1-weighted VB image. This is contrast-enhanced. We have diffusion-weighted images. This is the high B value. We also have a low B value, which I don't show here. But the low and the high B value together, they are used for, for model building of the ADC the diffusion coefficient. And the arrow, they, both, they point to the tumor. And this is a segmentation. It's a manual segmentation done by Kari uh, and or Julia. So this paper here was actually published, uh, came, became, came online on Monday in 
communications biology. It's a, it's a joint collaboration with uh, Erling Havik, Camilla Krogstad, myself, and Ingfrid. So it's truly disciplinary, interdisciplinary. Okay, so this uh, feature is taken from the paper. I think, I hope that Erling will go more deeper into it. I will just present it briefly. On the left side, it's the radi radiomic side. We had the pictures. We extracted the features um, based on the manual segmentation by Kari and Julia. Extracted features. There were 53 features times three because we have three channels. And we did unsupervised clustering only based on the image features. So there's no clinical information in this clustering. It's only based on images. And then from these clusters, we did survival analysis. And then we repeated this process, extracted features from the images, but this time based on automatic simulation from machine learning. So we are thinking of having, in future, we could have like an automatic approach for simulation, an automatic approach for image texture extraction. We assigned, and we did not create new clusters, but we assigned the patients to their respective clusters. And in this process, we ex used exactly the same normalization factors that we had, we could read out from, from the manual training phase. And then we did a survival analysis again. And then we investigated these clusters based on molecular and, and genetic markers, which Erling will tell you more about. So this is the heat map that we obtained from the texture features. The rows, they show texture names. So you see it starts with a vol, that's the volume, tumor volume. Then it says V, B, A, D, C, and B1000. These are the three MR channels. And then it's the intensity, it's the uh, surface area, clustering, ketosis, and so on. So there's a, lo a large number of, of features. And on the columns, you see that's the patients. And the lines, they show the, the cluster, clustering. So there are three clusters here. And this plot here shows clinical phenotypes. And we clearly see there's an aggregation of high histologic grade and myometrial infiltration in, cluster, uh, in these two clusters. So they, they have been identified as high-risk clusters. So meaning that only based on image features, we were able to, to split our cohort into a low-risk cluster and two high-risk clusters, which in itself I find very interesting. But this is only possible after these normalization tricks. And these are the couple of Maya, Maya curves for these clusters. This was the, the low-risk cluster, and that was the combined two high-risk clusters, and here the high-risk clusters, they are split. And uh, on the y-axis is the disease-specific survival. And we clearly see there's a significant difference between those clusters, only based on image features. There's something showing up in the image features, which then uh, relates to, to, to risk of, of uh, severe disease. And we also found that this is not only tumor volume, it's also these results are still significant also for if you take away all the features that you think are directly connected to tumor volume. So and then we applied the automatic segmentation, which we published in this paper, automatic segmentation of endometrial cancer and MR images using deep learning, published in Scientific Reports 2021. So we segmented, um, um, I don't remember the number, it was quite many, and we extracted the features, and we assigned the patients to their respective cohorts. And of course, this approach will introduce some noise, because the deep learning segmentation is not as good as the human segmentation. Not far away from, but still not as good. So we would also expect that that would generate some noise in these couple of Maya curves. But we still see that there's a very clear differentiation between low-risk and high-risk patients assigned to these clusters that we generate with the manual segmentations. And we also see that for the, for the split of the high-risk cluster into two. So I find it very in intriguing that we, the automatic methods done in the very early stage on a clinical uh, investigation, you can say something if, whether a patient belongs to a low-risk or a high-risk group. 
And then finally, I want to present uh, use case two, unsupervised clustering of cervical cancer patients. You will also hear more about that later from, from Mari. So this is work in progress. There's still no paper out about it. But it's still cross-disciplinary and very interesting. We work with Mari Halle, Kamel Krakstad, Ingrid Halvdorsen, and myself. Same as in the previous slide, the row show radiomic features. This time I use pyoradiomics and had a larger number of features. And the columns are the patients. And after doing k midiwid clustering with PUM, we clearly see that it differentiates between different groups of patients. You see that by these bands here that, that show up. So, of course, you will always find some clusters that itself is not so fascinating, because as long as you have variance in your data, you will find some clusters. But if you plot this according to survival, disease-specific survival, we clearly see that we have able to identify one Low risk, high risk cluster, medium risk cluster, and a very low risk cluster with only one death due to disease in uh, five, six, six years or more. So, at least for me as a mathematician, that reminds it is a bit striking that you can separate your groups that strongly. But of course, this needs to be investigated biologically to identify uh, the biological mechanisms behind. So then we have uh, an updated workflow. The standard workflow would be that you have an incoming patient, you do MR imaging, radiologist reading, which contributes to the clinical decision making, and also biopsy and pathologist, pathologist reading. But uh, the new possible elements that you can attach to this workflow is the automatic slash manual segmentation, extract features, and you can get also a machine um, evaluation of the, the risk group of your patient. So we have <clears throat> I think that radiomics represents a new and very promising tool for diagnostics and prognostication in cancer imaging. And uh, definitely the data, which may be the biggest challenge, because your data needs to be normalized properly. And this can be challenging across centers with such so much variability between AMR sequences and and the uh, sites. But still, we found that endometrial cancer patients clustered very well into low and high risk groups only based on image texture variables. And this was confirmed also for the deep learning segmentations, which open up po possibilities for clinical use, of course, later. I mean, it's also interesting to see a similar pattern for cervical cancer patients. And I think that shows us that Reomex has at least a potential use in early diagnosis and for choice of treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. This was very interesting and it really displays the collaboration that we have been able to establish across disciplines. Uh, there were several questions. I want to pick one of them from Hauke. Uh, he said, set normalization should potentially be done for any exchangeable set in the data in order not just to normalize the data, but also to estimate confidence intervals. Would you think you can do this in a single step instead of doing normalization as a pre-processing step? It quite, was quite technical, but perhaps easy for a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> well, maybe. I need to think about it a little bit, but I don't like the idea to mix data that are from different sources, which have in itself different means. Because you, I don't think you will get rid of this split in the means by doing like a k-fold normalization. I guess you will, uh, if you do this that way, you will, might not gain what you are looking for. But we can discuss it at MIV. Alexander is commenting here, this needs to be investigated further to identify the biological mechanisms behind the clustering. That's really true, and that's, uh, that will be highlighted a little in the next presentation to what uh, we do to investigate the link to biology and other markers. 